You are listening to the Block A Pinball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Freebus, a.k.a. Shut Your Trap. Uh, seeing as how it is a Thursday morning and would be 2 a.m. in Australia, Jared is not with me right now. But instead, who we've got is our good friend over at uh, Zen, Mel Kirk, Vice President of Publishing. Hey, Chris. Good to be back with you. Absolutely. And of course, why would we possibly have Mel here? Nothing better than because of the <laughs> volume four announcement that just came out the other day. Um, so that's kind of the the impetus for all this, but we got a whole bunch of other things that we're going to uh, touch upon here. But first, we've got Whitewater, we've got Hurricane, we've got Roadshow coming in. Yep. Roadshow being the first wide body of the Williams that we've seen. Finally got one in there. Yeah. <laughs> Strangely enough, it doesn't look that different from all the previous Zen tables. Because didn't you say that uh, all the previous Zen originals were all wide body in design yeah. too? That was uh, largely our inspiration for original Zen uh, designs. And uh, and so, yeah, you're, you're right. There's some similarity there just in terms of uh, the way it looks on, uh, you know, when you're playing. Wide bodies are tricky too. Well, I mean, obviously these aren't your giant bally wide bodies or the old stern electronics wide bodies which are like square tables practically yeah. but in general wide bodies are a little bit different because it changes the the speed and the flow of the ball it absolutely does um and so uh you know in our advanced physics simulations and whatnot we we account for that but it does play differently um you know from uh, the other types of cabs out there uh and so i think it's re reflective in this release uh you know it'll i think it people will automatically notice that it, the, the game is playing differently. It's playing the way it should. So I've been playing the uh, the betas of all these for quite a few weeks now. Yeah. And it was one of those things where I was scared at first to do the enhancement because I was like, I really like just the plastic faces of Red and Ted, and I didn't want them to be animated. And thankfully, you guys didn't. But instead, you, they're beautifully rendered. There's a lot of just like the lighting on it and the and the shapes of them are fantastic. There's not this not flat look at all. Instead, we've got a crazy ass bulldozer that jumps all over the place. <laughs> yeah, it comes slipping in and out of there. Um, it was kind of a funny touch. I, I think we carry some of the humor and you know some of the the mood of the table with the the 3D interactions that we've created. It's also kind of odd because I mean, unless you're looking at either the backlash or the side art, you never get a sense that these are red and Ted or you know, real people. And so seeing this guy driving a bulldozer, I was like, who the heck is that? And then I look closer. And I'm like, Oh, it's Ted. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're not adding any new, like, you know, no new characters or story or anything like that. We're keeping in the confines of it's, it's interesting though, where you guys pull your source stuff from. Cause it, it's not like you're just you know creating a character you know using the head and then creating the body or whatever. You're actually pulling it from some piece of art on the table. Yeah, I, I think that it's still kind of our mindset that uh, we want to stay within the nostalgia and like the, the stuff that people love about these and not go too far into the deep end of creating like brand new, you know, just new story or new characters or yeah. things that people don't already associate with. Um, I, I think we're just we're sticking to our mission of being authentic still and maybe being additive or complementary to an already amazing game. You know, that's what these are to us. They're already amazing games and we're just... We're giving them a, a, a just a new feel, and that's the, from the very beginning when we were talking with you guys about what we wanted to accomplish with these tables. Um, you know, I, I think that that's that's where our focus is, and we're maintaining that that identity. I know with Roadshow, it was one of those tables that uh, after you drained your third ball, it would give you the option of, hey, do you want to continue for an extra credit? But Zen so far hasn't allowed that option. In. Is that just basically because it's free play mode? Yeah, I. Yeah. It's just what it is. Um, you know, I guess if you want to just continue playing like that, you might as well just go into practice mode and, and have at it. Yeah. For for a home use console, PC, mobile, and whatever else we ship on, you know, games will play like that. In a in a potential commercial setting or something, it could change. Uh -huh. you know? um, but yeah, for now, it's just like, it's just free play. Just start the game over. Uh, and then we have Hurricane, <laughs> which... The clown disturbs me. Now, that's actually been a critique of buying for all of those tables. I'm not a fan of Angelo's uh, artwork. <laughs> but the clown you guys have on there, I just kind of, just a suggestion, 
Come September, retheme that thing and turn it into it and make him Pennywise holding a balloon and that big game right. over. We're done. <laughs> it's, awesome. it's funny you mentioned it. it uh, I yeah, I watched the you know trailer for part two. It's yeah. one of my all-time favorite books and stories. Um, but yeah, you're totally right. I think that would be a, that's an easy thing to do, right? Right. Yeah. And if he was just standing there still, because he's for those that haven't seen the video, and you'll see it eventually, but uh, basically they they animated the clown that's right there at the bottom of the, the playfield art, and he's just standing there right above the dunk tank, and he throws pies and pulls balls out of his butt and, and stuff. It's kind of... <laughs> well, he, well, reaches behind him and pulls things out, but... Um, but I was, he's right there dead center of the play field. And I was just like, oh man, if that was just Pennywise just standing there dead still holding a balloon. And then every now and then would you like suddenly scamper at you? That'd be, yeah. <laughs> It'd be awesome. Horror table. You guys haven't done one of those yet. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it, it goes back to like, we always try to stay within the confines of our rating for everybody to accept, yeah. access the game. Um, you know, and so we, we've dealt with some issues on, on, you know, mature content and whatnot uh, as we've gone through this Williams process. But, yeah, man, horror is like an untapped genre for us. I think there's a lot of adult themes. There's like a pinball after dark just waiting to happen, you know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we, we've had rumors of that for years. <laughs> it never came about, but, you know. <laughs> um, uh, so, and, and Hurricane, basically, it finishes out the... the Comet and Cyclone trilogy, which we don't have in this game, but it's obviously with the the DMD of all those. And then we have Whitewater, which is this was the one I was really when I first saw you guys doing plastics the way you were doing your clear plastics. I was like, I've got to see what they do with Whitewater, um, and it's beautiful. Good, it looks amazing. Okay, yeah the 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 plastics are beautifully done. Um, I think that we've that we've nailed them. This is the game to highlight our ability to um, to do the coloring, the lighting. Um, mm -hmm. it, it turned out really well. Um, I love what we did with Bigfoot. I think he's, he's, it's funny. It's a good touch. Uh, I I don't know if you guys caught the the video of Ten Hours of Whitewater. <laughs> yeah, that sent people into a dizzy. There was somebody that actually downloaded the whole thing because he's a video editor, compressed it, and checked for if there was any hidden messages within the entire thing. So that's that's our fan base right there, okay? <laughs> yeah, maybe we thought we're like, man, people would be looking for Easter eggs or, or something. Um, but yeah, I got the jingle like stuck in my head. I had it on for like an hour the other day just because uh, <laughs> I started it up just to watch it, just to yeah. see what was, you know, uh, on the, before we released it. And it was funny, I got busy doing other stuff and uh, after an hour, I was like, what is driving me nuts? And it was sure enough, it was that playing in the background. <laughs> I mean, I'm even impressed. So something, folks, when you're playing the game, push up on one of the joysticks. I forget which one it is. I think it's the right one. Um, and then you can look at the the uh, back glass. Hmm. And you guys fully animated the topper, which, I mean, that's a given for for Whitewater. The, that topper is beautiful, and it's it's really good. I mean, it's like it's such a throwaway animation that most people aren't even going to look at, but there it is. You know. So, you know, uh, we're fans too. I, I hope it, it comes <laughs> through, you know, like the, the things that we do are, are, you know, just things that we think really uh, dress up something that's already very special and that we think make the right touches. So we're, you know, that's intentional. It's not like it, we decided like, you know, whoever's the biggest Whitewater fan at the studio got to design, decide what we're going to do to this to make it, you know, the Zen version. So right. those are things that are very intentional. I do wish that you guys had done some animated water for the waterfall or for the whirlpool and enhanced, but that's small quibble. Um, there's always little things like that that we go, oh, but why didn't, you know, it's like, for instance, with uh, Champion Pub, it was like, oh, why didn't the boxer's face change for each and every boxer? It was like, oh, that would have been awesome. But Well, hey, if the community wasn't so antsy to have games released literally like every month or every couple of weeks, <laughs> We could take longer, I guess, you know, but then the, the cycles would be longer and you guys would be waiting more. Uh, uh, we feel the, we feel <laughs> the demand, let me tell you, uh, you know, I mean, you've spoken with ACOS, our community yeah. manager. That guy does not have an easy job. <laughs> 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 Trying to hold everybody back about how antsy they are for every single game to be here today. Right. So, on every platform, playable in every way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Poor guy. Um, the other thing that's being released with Volume 4, and it's just for the Volume 4 tables that are out right now, but you guys have new flipper physics. Correct. 
And um, it, it, oh yeah, go. I was gonna say flipper physics are coming to all the Williams tables. So I know you've been playing them with the with the three in, in oh, beta. Okay. It, it will be deployed to all the tables. At, on upon release, or is it delayed until a little bit later? Uh, upon release, I'm I'm pretty certain that we are able to release it through all tables. Oh, that's um, fantastic! On May twenty eighth. Yep. Great. Um, and I can say, folks, they're pretty awesome. Um, I mean, just. Like, again, people pointed out in the video, they noticed the slight little, when the ball hits the flipper, it kind of does that little tap down. Uh, you know, obviously it's being affected by that. Uh, but it's not just a visual thing. It actually affects what you're able to do with the ball. And even better, and this is my favorite part, is you get some of the little wonky ball spin action that happens when it, when it hits on the flipper. So yeah. I always like that. Just a uh, little bit of randomness. Yeah, it is. It's very true to form. It, you know, of course, we're biased over here. We think this is the best it's ever been, right? Um, yeah. in, in Deep, who's responsible for this uh, physics simulation, has put a lot of time and a lot of effort. It, and this is um, the, the the flipper physics that are being released here in the late May have been in the works a long time. This is not something he just cooked up in a couple of weeks. I mean, really, since we began began on this project, this is something he's been working on. Now it's ready to go. So it, it's a lot of time, a lot of effort. Uh, we we hope uh, the diehard all you you know you represent a, sec a section of this diehard community and you guys have been playing it so pretty sure we're 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 in a good spot. Yeah, I think most of our listeners pretty much play only in arcade you know classic single player arcade mode um, rather than playing the standard what we call Zen mode. Um, yep. <laughs> It, it's kind of funny. We have our own way of labeling what everything is versus what it says in the game. <laughs> it kind of keeps ours. It, it makes it difficult when talking to people going, well, it's this mode. And they're like, but there's nothing in the menu that says that. That's not what we mean. Yeah. Come up with your own lingo and terminology for our modes. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, is there any potential? I mean, we always ask this and it, and it relates to all of this. So previously we were saying, oh, it'd be great if we had the Williams physics in the regular Zen original tables. Um, what about, I mean, would the flipper physics be even something, or is it again, it becomes all about that. You have to retune the entire table uh, to match what that physics is. Yeah, it's, it's a huge undertaking. We would have to go through game by game. Yeah, okay. Games, uh, with, with physics. Um, we, uh, you know, it, it's something from the very beginning when we launched Williams, uh, we started to hear, we heard the feedback from you guys first. Uh, we hear it from other places as well um, and other sources. So we know that there's a uh, demand for it. There's always this, um, and you look at the history of Zen, the way that we've treated our pinball platforms, you know, there's always been like, there's platform, which we've given away for free. There's yeah. content, which we sell. And then when we do a major upgrade to platform, we, we let you take the tables with you. So that's a major investment on Zen's part to do that. And um, uh, for we have to really be clear on which features we want to focus on and make the most people happy with because of our, because of the way we've committed to our, to our community, because right. of the way we sell content. We don't sell it to you over and over again. Once you get it, you get it. And then we just update the features. So is that the feature that is most, that would make the most people happy and, and keep them coming over with us as we create new content? You know, these are things that we're constantly asking ourselves. This is just a, this is a look into our process and the way that we think about it. Um, it's an overall relationship with the player over the course of like a decade. Um, and so th these features, you know, we just, we kind of keep a running tab of what's the most important thing. Um, I do think that the, that the physics on the new game, and especially when we keep adding like the flipper physics update, it's becoming a bigger uh, priority for us to apply to all games because the community that's come for Williams now is so large. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people that we didn't have with us before. I do think as a feature, that would help us sell you guys our, our other tables because they're worth playing now for you. Yeah. So, uh, so it is very important. I think that we're focusing on this in the future. So, beyond Volume Four, basically, if we're sticking to DMD only machines uh, currently that you're doing, there's six left. Uh, so, two more volume packs of the unlicensed tables. Um. Is there is it the intent that you guys will be doing alphanumeric and solid state tables, or is Zen gonna only do DMD tables? Uh, it's funny. Were you e reading my email this morning? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, yeah, you're right. We're we're almost done with the uh, DMDs, 
And uh, what's after that will be, uh, obviously there's more to do and uh, there's a lot of tables out there. Uh, so I would say that alphanumeric is on its way very soon. Fantastic. The other question, I don't know if I've, I, I think I've asked you this before, but I'm not quite hundred percent positive. Um, is Zen buying the tables or borrowing some of the tables? I mean, how does that work with what you guys do? And specifically with what we were thinking is, look, Cactus Canyon is on the way. It's not an easy table to find, and I have no clue how hard it is to find in Europe. Um, so we were like, oh, I wonder if they're going to have to fly people over to the Pinball uh, Pacific Pinball Museum. But so what is Zen's, uh, how do you guys do that? Are, are you just borrowing tables or, or purchasing them outright? Combination of things. Uh, we have a, a decent sized collection in, in our studio. Some of those are the personal uh, collection of Jolt, our CEO, and others are, you know, ones that the, the studio has bought and purchased and they're there. The uh, Budapest Pinball Museum is massive and they've got a lot of games. Uh, we have borrowed some from them and uh, they bring it over to our office and we do the disassemble there and we do all the all the work and then we uh, put it back together and put it back in the museum so there's a good great relationship with with that museum and then um, there's some very specialty things that we've had to track down and uh, uh, so yeah you're, you're right like cactus canyon very difficult to find very expensive um, but there we, we always have our ways uh, when <laughs> when you're in the pinball community and you need something and you're somewhat well known now. You can uh, you you can make it happen. So okay. yeah, yeah. I remember when when Farsight did their version of Cactus Canyon. It was one of those things where they weren't intending to do it yet, and it popped up on a for sale near them. They're like, we have to buy it now. It's just <laughs> there's we can't delay. Go do it. And I think they wound up saying that that was the most expensive table out of all the tables that they bought. It was clearly by and far away the most expensive that they outlaid for. Yep. There's not many. Uh, Cactus Canyon is very rare in Europe. Like yeah. very rare. That's what I figured. Um, and I won't. I'll, I'll just say Cactus Canyon continued. But the more I've researched it, the less I think you guys will be able to do it. <laughs> I think there's some licensing issues that might be <laughs> in the way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of these have even like you know, look at uh, you know Roadshow. There was some. There's licensing. There, a lot of these tables have like hidden gems in them. When you really dig into it, and if you're going to do it right, and you're going to do it everything legal and by the book, yeah. there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of things. That's the only way Zen can work because of our history now of licensing. Right. We we, we can't be rogue. So like even Roadshow, uh, Carlene Carter, her song and her likeness are all properly licensed. Um, you go back to Getaway, the song, the ZZ Top song, and there's properly licensed. There's even some Frank Sinatra stuff in there. Um, there's a lot of, we were doing it all, you know, very officially, which also is some of the reason maybe why you guys are wondering where the third party stuff is. Well, to do it right, it takes some time. Third party stuff being the licensed uh, DMD tables that we've all been talking about. Um, right. Are we expecting to see any licensed tables, uh, call it by December? Uh, You'll see them in 2019. Into 2019, we will see some. Okay, great. I would um, target maybe like Halloween for the first ones. Okay, fair enough. Um, and those, just to be clear also, they're, I know you said that they won't be part of a volume. They'll be their own release, but they'll still be within the FX3 or the Williams Pinball uh, mobile platform. It's not like it's going to be its own separate app. Correct. Yeah, they'll okay. be within. They'll be within the platform itself. Uh, this collection will always be by itself. There won't just be like some outlier, one table over here, one table over there. Um, right now, there. That's that is uh, that is absolutely the plan. And for 2019, you know, probably into early 2020, that is absolutely the way it'll work. Okay, cool. Well, we have covered all the Williams stuff. Now let's get into the fun stuff. You went to Star Wars Celebration in Chicago, <laughs> which of course made me fiercely jealous. Um, how is that as a show? I mean, I don't even know what it, it necessarily is. Uh, is it kind of like what Comic-Con is where there's a lot of vendor booths and then there's you know a hall where they do information or, or what is that? Yeah. Uh, so there's a main hall where there is uh, tons of Star Wars stuff. It's, you know, obviously all Star Wars stuff. Yeah. You can buy old classic toys that are super rare. You can buy signed artwork. There's um, There's commissioned artists who are actually like, working on pieces there. And if you buy a piece of their art, you just take it over to them and they sign it for you. So I get to meet all the cool artists, um, some that we might be able to collaborate with on our Star Wars projects in the future. Um, there's uh, there's people selling uh, 
anything that you can imagine is branded Star Wars. <laughs> um, and then there's like a whole section of the show where it's just media related stuff where they're on, you know, the stage, they bring the cast out for Star Wars nine onto the, the stage and they're, they do the reveal of the trailer. And like, that's amazing. Um, there's just anything that related to Star Wars culture is there. It's the most passionate, hardcore Star Wars fans in the world. And they use it to really set the stage for, you know, the year. And May the 4th is shortly thereafter. And then, of course, this year is massive with, like, Mandalorian show shipping and Star Wars 9. And, and, and they revealed their their new animated series or Clone Wars is coming back. And mm -hmm. so it's just, like, it, it, if you're a Star Wars fan, you, like, you have to go at some point in your life because it's really, really special. Uh, it's funny. I had spent a few days in Disneyland prior to yeah. – I went from three days in Disneyland straight to Star Wars – celebration i was like in disney world for like 10 days just i was living in a fantasy land it was hilarious except for when you were there they still hadn't had the uh the expansion uh the star wars world opened yet i think it opened about three weeks after you were there and lower yeah, left it's, never, it's actually opening in a couple weeks um and and so uh, right correct it was not open when i was there yeah um and i can't say anything more about that but yeah. um because that's know. my deck for the way I, I literally am eight miles north as the crow flies. So yeah. I hear their fireworks every night. Uh, <laughs> Hilarious. But, and I think next year, actually, the, the Star Wars celebration is going to be in Anaheim. It's coming to Anaheim. Yeah. So if, if plan on going, um, we will be there and uh, we can, uh, we can all hang out and talk. And we were, it was kind of cool. We, it's actually the first celebration I went to. We've had others and people at, celebrations just the timing for me to go didn't work but i wanted to go to this one because we were we announced star wars pinball on switch you know which right. was shipping retail so if you don't think we've been busy i mean we're shipping a star wars retail game which is like the first time in six years that anyone's done that other than ea so that's uh pretty impressive if you understand uh, the world of <laughs> games um and then we were also showing uh which i know you want to talk about a virtual pinball cabinet so for me, it just made sense. To, anytime I'm going to go somewhere for like, I was there for six days in Chicago, which is insane. Yeah. Um, for me to be away out of the office, like doing one thing, focus on one product line. Um, we did a lot of things in Chicago too, but I wish I think everybody saw, but um, it worked out for me to be there. Let's talk about it real quickly with the Switch release, because normally you guys don't make an announcement uh, that many months in advance of it being available. Um, but obviously you can't deny the timing of, you know, that's such a large venue to be able to make an announcement with. Obviously, you get a lot of, of runway. But you've got the game fully running and all that. Is the September release for the Switch with the Star Wars games, is that mainly because of the retail aspect? Or are you just kind of, is it more like riding the crest of the wave as it builds up to the excitement for the movie being released in December? It's a combination of all those things. Uh because we're shipping on retail, we had to know our launch date well in advance, which has allowed us kind of the opportunity to announce it when we wanted to, and then have a nice, you know, period. Uh, we're going to be at E3 next month, so we'll be showing it there, and then like probably Gamescom and PAX. So we get a much bigger marketing um, push behind it because we're going to retail. We need that. Um, it's just a whole different process. It's a whole different type of thing that you go through. The production of cartridges takes a long time, um, and then yeah, September was very intentional. There's other Star Wars games coming. I was fortunate enough to, uh, to look at. Um, uh, Fallen Order, I, I believe it's called from EA uh, when, when we're in celebration, which is, you know, that's a massive game. So there's a lot of Star Wars stuff lining up, and that was our window for us where we're not competing with like a bunch of other Star Wars stuff. They've given us our own window and our own place to shine. We're the first Star Wars content on Nintendo Switch, which is like very special. Um, and oh, Star Wars wow. has a great history together of, of great games. So, you know, I think we'll be joining the ranks of like good, good Star Wars games on Nintendo. So all these factors, all these things put together. Yeah, we're in September. It's out there. Uh, we have a very long you know, period in front of us in which to promote the game. That's great. Um, one of the other things with the Switch, uh, you guys were talking about how it's kind of gotten exclusive, not content, but uh, uh, let's say game aspects where you're choosing light side, dark side, uh, to build up your, I don't even know what. All I can think of though, wasn't there something similar to that on mobile with the Star Wars app where it was kind of a pick a light side, dark side? Or am I thinking of a specific, one of the specific tables had that aspect to it? No, you're, you're correct. There was a thing that we call balance of the force. That's and it. So we've taken galactic, uh, the, the galactic struggle and we've taken, you know, that is an iteration uh, the the balance of the force or whatever it was that we had was like the very first type of this. This is taking it much further uh, because the metagame, 
um, contributes to this now uh, in a much deeper way. And it's updated uh, real time before it was kind of delayed, but now it's just like people log, they, they come into play and they see what's happening in a dynamic way. So we kind of took some early ideas, which um, we launched years ago, and now we've really developed it based on new technology, based on there's more to do in the pinball game itself. So uh, the Galactic Struggle should be a lot of fun uh, for players. My daughter is like, she's all about, you know, light side. She loves Luke. I'm, I tend to go more towards the dark side. I bought some Kylo Ren shoes at Celebration, and I'm always <laughs> Darth Vader tees yeah. and stuff. So we're going to be uh, teeing off against each other. It'll be pretty funny. That's awesome. And Switch is, I mean, we keep on saying it, but it's such a great platform for pinball. Uh, being able to put it in a vertical screen, flop it in your flip grip. Yeah. And, and and I read something the other day that they go, somebody was like, the Switch is what the PlayStation Vita wished it could have been. And I was like, you know what? That's pretty much nails it. Console in your hand, nice big screen, very portable, and you can plug it in and play it on your TV. So it, it is kind of a, a, a genius platform for pinball. I, I think it's really the. I'm, I don't know. I'm a little biased. I think <laughs> it's the best platform uh, available, and, and then you can dock it, and it's the home system. But like the HD Rumble, I think we're getting it. Uh, you know, I think we're getting it right. It felt a little overbearing at first, but um, yeah. But I do, I just think I love the di the portability of the device and how easy it is to use and how good it looks, and then then it's the home system. It makes so much sense. Um, okay, so then on to the other thing that obviously that I was dying to know more about. Uh, yeah, you guys had this ginormous cabinet that had full video on the side of it displaying the Star Wars game, and obviously all 19 uh, Star Wars tables were loaded up onto this thing. Um, I'm assuming this is what you are planning on putting out there for the commercial use, because uh, it looks like it's built like a tank. It is. Uh, this is our, what you saw there um, was a commercial prototype. Uh, it's codenamed our LED commercial prototype. Okay. And um, it's a, been a long time coming. It's it's funny. We're probably, this is like Pinball Machine 4.0. If you look all the way back, you know, back in, in the early Steam DIY days when people asked us to just enable vertical monitor orientation, we turned that on. Suddenly you had, you know, it was cool because it was just a DIY thing. Guys in the garage is building pinball machines. Yeah. Um, then you saw a version of it come from like uh, VP cabs and then they got on the shark tank and they got a deal with Damon John and they've been successfully selling to the home use market for a while. And, um, and then, you know, you get people want pinball. It, it's, it's massive. Stern's really brought the game back, you know, in the barcades and whatnot, but you know, uh, places like Dave and Buster's or, um, really high end like modern day game rooms want very flashy, glitzy video gaming type of stuff and pinball machines haven't, fit their model for a number of reasons. Um, and so here we are, we've kind of evolved over the course of like five or six years. And now we're, we've got this thing showing at Star Wars Celebration, which is completely lit up. It doesn't, it looks like, you know, a spaceship <laughs> <laughs> legs instead of four legs. And it, there's no longer like a box coffin look. It's all rounded edges. It's all lit up the whole entire thing. It can run multiple games at once. It can be updated all the time is whenever we want to do it. It can be networked with other machines around the world. It can, you can run live events on it. It's pretty amazing. Wow. Um, I mean, you kind of, if you're thinking about putting anything in Dave and Buster's, it has to be <laughs> outlandishly eye catching. And so I think that uh, it, it seems like a natural fit there that, yeah, um, it's not just going to be a row of pinball machines. It's boom, here it is. Uh, you, there was an interview that was done with, and it escapes me who there was two gals that were doing the interview. Um, there were Star Wars fans had seemed like never played pinball before. Um, and they were really having a good time. And it was kind of interesting. Me and Jared talked about it, how not being pinball people, their approach to the tables and they were glomming on to all the Star wars -iness of it and just found themselves then happening to enjoy a pinball game. And it kind of, you can kind of see that turn where they're like, Oh, Hey, this is kind of, Hey, maybe I'd like the pinball stuff too. You know, it, it was interesting, but they mentioned that you can set it up to be just Star Wars. You can set it up to be just Marvel. Um, is the intention to have a limited amount of your guys' tables on a particular machine, or is it going to be somebody walks up and they can pick any of the, I don't know what you guys are up to, 80 different original tables or something like that. Um, how is that going to work? Well, in a commercial setting, uh, and you know, there's some details that still I can't fully reveal, but I'll just tell you, we have, we have some units already in live beta 
in, in live locations uh, around in North America. And so um, because it's a device that's connected to our server, we get data off that machine. And data is much in AI and machine learning and stuff is way smarter than we are like on a, on a daily basis. So the game can become whatever is best for that location. Ah. And, um, and it can, it, it, uh, there's a certain number of tables, which is optimal. Um, you want the, the, the machine turning over a certain amount of times, right? If people if yeah. you give them tyranny of choices, we call it, you have too many options. Like I, if I go to buy toothpaste and that's why I don't go buy toothpaste. I sit there and, and look at the aisle forever. <laughs> Same thing on a pinball machine. If you have too many games, people are just swiping and looking at a grid, uh, or something for too long, they don't know what to play. Yeah. So you've got to help them make their choice. Well, it is dynamic, it can, you know, because there's all that LED uh, panel on there and the, the video um, can be connected to whatever game they're playing. So, yeah, sure, one minute it can be uh, Star Wars and you, know, you got TIE Fighters and X-Wings fighting each other. And the next, uh, if you want to play Jurassic Park, you've got dinosaurs walking across the, the thing. So from a brand standpoint, the exposure we give our IPs to the game itself, which is very attractive to people, which they can easily play and then to the operation of it, all three of those things together are really combining for a very, um, a very unique thing on a location-based game that is that's not really been done before. Are the Williams tables going to be able to be part of that, or is that uh, again dealing with licensing and uh, uh, whatever agreement you guys have with with Williams? Uh, yeah, we're able to do that with Williams, and uh, we're. Actually, some of the experiments that we're running right now in our beta locations, we're going to be uploading Attack from Mars uh, to okay. the, the locations here uh, probably in the next week or so. What will happen is a table that is no longer getting played because everyone at that area or that place is, is enjoyed it and it's just, you know, they want to play something else. We just remove that. It just uh, disappears and then they want to play. So. And this is going to be a uh, card swipe uh, kind of cabinet, right? It's not a coin drop? Uh, we have several different business models associated with it. It does work with a card swipe, like an embed or something like that. We've done all the work there for that. Um, Jared, when he saw this, he got all excited and I wanted to make sure that I bring this up because he was wondering, is any of your gameplay that you play on this machine going to be able to tap into then like communicate with your mobile device? Um, your, or almost to the extent, you know how like Jersey Jack throws up the, the QR code for you know tweeting out your score, but almost like, hey, you enjoyed this, download the app, you know, kind of thing. I mean, is there going to be kind of any of that integration uh, trying to sync you back into, uh, you know, taking it home with you, if you will? Location-based gaming is going to change quite dramatically um, very soon. It's connected. It will be connected uh, to your mobile device. Um, you can gamify even locations that just have machines like this. You can mm -hmm. create loyalty programs. You can drive foot traffic to location. So the symbiotic communication happening between your mobile and your location-based game um, is going to be uh, much – trying to talk around uh, – Yes. <laughs> uh, you, get what, you get what I'm saying. Um, yeah, I think that the world we live in with people wanting uh, – I think it's funny because I, I just think in general, in sense, people have suddenly become sick. At least I know I have. So I'm talking about myself, and yeah. uh, I've become sick of like communicating just just with this. And and um, I want to have um, social experiences again. To me, it sounds fantastic to go to a game room, play games where it feels like I'm participating in how I went on my Xbox or my phone, but I'm in a social environment and having food and drinks, and maybe my family's there. Um, I do think that socially, like the arcade, and we all know we all, we can all feel arcades are coming back. They're popping up again everywhere. Whether it's a barcade, whether it's a Dave and Buster's type of spot, whether it's a cruise ship with game rooms, whether it's Four Seasons who are building game rooms everywhere, this this social experience is is coming. And I think that now that we have a phone, we have high end devices, we have the way video games function and work now within social fabric of community. Uh, I think we're going to see like the world changing with, with games in an offline way, and now location can be online. Um, I think that there's a lot, uh, and I think our, our, I think our machine is somehow at the center of this. So, mm. um, I mean, obviously the, the mere fact that you can communicate with the machine at any time and update what it's doing, uh, opens up a world of possibilities. Are the games going to be standard three ball games or are they going to be timed sessions or doing the challenges? How is that? Uh, what options are there going to be for these? 
Yeah, right now it's just uh, there, it's a standard standard three ball game. Okay. Um, there's a lot that we can do, especially uh, on the, on the service side and on uh, event side. You know, it's uh, it's it's a very uh, how how do I say it's an approachable esport or a you know the, the casual person can walk up and think they have a shot. So if you give them an option to do a one ball high score challenge and you're going to win X amount of tickets or you're entered to win something. Yeah. Um, those are things that I think most people just, you know, they want to participate in. They don't even think that they're playing an e-sport. They don't think that they're like competing, but it's just something that's very fun and entertaining and that they get because everyone knows what a ball and flippers is like. They can identify pinball. It's yeah. something to understand. So I think it's a, it's a unique position um, versus like a first person shooter or even a racing game or, you know, something like that. And Zen's been dancing with this esports idea for a little while, so it sounds like you're getting even closer and closer to uh, becoming a, a true reality. Yeah, and I don't think that it's like an esport the way that we think of esports. I think it's just like I said, it's very approachable. It's a it's kind of a casual sport, you know. It's it's like the way that everybody plays mini golf. You're playing golf. You're not out there like swinging a huge club, but you're playing golf, you know. Um, and while there's on the, the IFPA is doing very, you know, doing well. Like there's tons of players and there's guys competing for decent amounts of money and they're traveling and the circuit is being built out. Um, that, that only appeals to a very small segment of the hardcore population. Whereas this is, this is truly mass market. Um, especially when you're dealing with the type of brands, type of integrations we can do timed with film releases or special promotions. Um, right. It, it, it's just, it's just a different, this is different. It's, it's massive. Yeah. Okay. While you were in Chicago, you sent out a tweet that sent us into a flurry. And I don't know how much you can say about it, but I'm going to have you. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring it up. No. There is you a picture uh, with uh, Gary Stern and the hashtags Stern and future. Uh, <laughs> were you just trolling us or is there something in the works or what? what is there anything that can be said about that? <laughs> I also have a picture of uh, Gary and I sharing a steak. That was pretty cool. <laughs> I don't think I saw that one. <laughs> and uh, I've got a very special piece of paper uh, with um, that's signed by George Gomez, Brian Eddy, and Gary Stern, which was our my my uh, bar, our, our basically our, our uh, barricade pinball pub crawl that we did in, in that night, uh, which is really cool. Which I'm going to frame and put on my wall. Um, Gary did this whole printout for me of where we were going to go and why locations are different and what's cool about each one. And they all three signed it. And there's like a drip of wine on the, on the paper. <laughs> to me, that's like treasure. Right. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, uh, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of things that th there's common interests. I think if you look at the machines that they've done over the last few years and you look at the, on the licensing and you look at, at uh, stuff, I mean, there's just things that we, so obviously should do together and can do. And the only way it can happen is if we do it together. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that the, the future you're going to see, you know, you're, you're going to see some stuff and, um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's about as much as I can say. <laughs> that's about how much I figured you'd be able to say. Yeah. But... <laughs> I'll just say though, first and foremost, I have like major fans of, of these guys and like just honored to be in their presence and like to talk about ideas, talk about where the game is going with the future. It's not just about Zen and Stern. It's like, what does the future of pinball look like? Yeah. And you know, what do we, what, what do the major players and the guys who have stakes in this and the people who have invested long-term now in the game of pinball. And we've got this awesome community of people who love to buy our products, play our, our games they want it, They want more. How do we pioneer this uh, so that it gets bigger and better for everybody? We in like companies like Zen, companies like Stern, we have a, a role to play in this, you know. So uh, just figuring those pieces out. There was some people have been asking about uh, where we are with VR, uh, just in terms of even more Zen original VR tables, but obviously also are we at all pushing towards having any of the Williams tables in VR. Um, where is uh, Zen's stance on VR at the moment? Um, we want to do more VR. We want to do it like, believe me, I, you know, I, we want to push stuff out at much quicker pace. Uh, I was just, we were talking again about if we're going to do more VR tables, which ones are we doing? Um, you know, there's, there's, there, there's some big things we could do. I mean, you could have, if say we want to do star Wars pinball in VR, like, that would be an entire standalone game and it would take a long time and it'd be huge. And man, we could do like the cantina and your pinball machines. And cantina. But 
uh, you know, maybe I know that there's huge requests for Williams stuff as well. People want Jurassic Park. Like we, we seem, it just feels like, okay, everybody wants VR. Um, the market is changing pretty quickly. Quest is, is going to, I think, be a game changer for VR uh, from Oculus. Um, we'd like to see more people just in general having have VR headsets. We need we need a bigger market to really go like, you know, like next. Dropping a few tables here and there is okay, but like you know we need to be able to move some units and uh, we've done fine. It's been it's been good, but it's not as good as like just selling tables on mo you know the way that mobile works or the way that uh, consoles work right now. Right. Kind of a long rambling answer all to say like I don't know. <laughs> I don't know when our next VR release is happening, what content we're doing, but we feel we feel the the request for it. The other th uh, thing that pops up a lot, and something tells me this falls into line with where you were saying there's the laundry list of requests to get put out there, but you got to prioritize what is going to help move the game forward the most. But uh, one of those is with the lighting. People keep on asking about adjustable lighting uh, for the tables. Um, is that Again, one of those things is just kind of down there with like adding Williams physics to all the Zen originals, or uh, has hey, there been that conversation? Chris, could you uh, repeat that little segment? For some reason, the my screen froze. I don't know. Oh, sure. I, I missed that little section. Sure. Uh, talking about adjustable lighting, uh, whether or not that's something that's been in a conversation uh, with you guys at Zen as to should the, it be implemented, or are you just fine with how lighting is? Um, I was just saying, I know that it probably falls under that same category of adding physics to prior William or to Zen original games where it's, yes, we hear the request, but it's down there on the, on the list. Yeah. Features and content. And uh, we try to make them both happen simultaneously as, as best as possible. Um, and reality is, uh, to do good, to do good work takes time. Um, I, I, we, you know, I'm impressed with what the Zachariah guys are doing right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm that that's that you know i think they're only a couple like two guys yeah uh, it's small <laughs> i think it's a whole team of four <laughs> it's a yeah, but uh i mean you know competition is good regardless of what people some people say that zen doesn't you know we want it, we, we don't want to be the only pinball developer in town it's not true i think competition is good it, what those guys are doing drives us to take a look at what we're doing and be better and but it's just when you get to certain size of things as well, it just takes, um, there's certain things that take longer when you're dealing with licensing. And um, in the, if you start a new, so like say, sure, we're gonna change the way that we offer lighting features and, and or we do lighting, whatever. When we draw this line in the sand, every new table going forward is gonna operate like this. Then all the rest of them feel neglected or old or whatever. And then people are like, well, why doesn't this apply on Star Wars? And it's like, well, because we have to go all the way through an approval process and again with lucas arts on every or lucas film on every single table and that's overhead that they incur and they might say like zen we're not interested in like spending x amount of hours of our people's time for that you know we'd rather just make a new table so it's like these are all things that that affect uh, decisions and our ability to because when you're talking about a huge library now of stuff yeah you know it's to do it all the way across on, on a, the board is not it's, it's not a I've told this to you before. It's not the, the, the push of the mat of the button. And I know you get it, but you know, hopefully everybody else understands. Um, you know, we have to deal with a complex pipeline of production, lots of different licenses, lots of different platforms, um, many different player groups, emerging technologies. You know, what are we doing on the next set of devices that are rumored to be coming or services that are rumored to be coming? Um, if we don't we don't like get there for we want our pinball there you know but what does that look like is it the entire library is it one do we focus on lighting instead of being on uh, i don't know google stadia you know what i mean like these are just things that we have to we, we're constantly juggling constantly making decisions about every day there's a decision like this um it, it's good to hear it See, I like having it come out of your mouth because when it comes out of my mouth, people don't believe me. <laughs> so coming out of your mouth, I think it definitely carries more weight in terms of of uh, where you guys are at with that kind of thing. Um, you know, it's not that you're just like, nah, we don't want to do it, but there's when many more considerations to to factor in than just our desire. So the there was talk a while back that you had teased that there were still some Zen original tables coming out in 2019. And those 
got delayed because I think you said that you guys got excited about uh, what were what was happening with two of the tables, and suddenly you want to make a third table. Uh, where are we at with those Zen Originals? Yeah, uh, so surprise, surprise, game development, game development, the way it works, right? Uh, I don't think those are going to make it in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we'll, we'll see, but right now it just looks like those are, are likely not to make it, uh, which is a bummer. I, that's one of the things I know is number one request is like Zen Originals. So uh, uh, I don't know. Hopefully I'll have a more solid update. Uh, and that's just the way game development works. Yeah indie studio doing a lot of different things, you know, so. Having sampled uh, Operancia, I couldn't help but think, well, come on, that's a natural fit to just fly itself over into a pinball original. But yeah, I was like, that's the delay right there. Um, <laughs> what other Zen games are in the works at the, at the moment? I mean, obviously, Operancia just came out over on uh, Epic Games. And uh, you've got the, the Zen Pimble Arcade. You've still got Castle Storm selling. You've still got Infinite Mini Golf um, and what Disco Dodgeball, I think. Um, any new games brewing? I know you've been crazy busy, so I'm assuming plenty of stuff is happening. We will be announcing a, a game uh, shortly before E3, like the day before E3 starts on the kind of funny game showcase with Greg Miller. Uh, we announced Operencia with him uh, on their initial showcase back in December. It worked out really well for us, so... Look for a brand new game announcement then. Um, there's another non-pinball game uh, that will launch from Zen this year. Uh, so yeah, that'll be three full non-pinball game releases, plus all the pinball stuff, um, plus a Star Wars retail product, plus uh, pinball machines. That's a pretty <laughs> fun busy year. So uh, <laughs> suddenly you look tired. <laughs> I don't know why I haven't been so available, unfortunately, for the last couple. Of years. I don't remember the last time I talked to you. I think it might have been in Budapest, actually. Yeah. How often um, do you find yourself in Budapest? I'm there every six weeks on a, maybe eight weeks on average. It it changes based on what's happening. And that's um, what a. I mean, because there's no direct flight, right? I mean, um, no. There, I usually fly to uh, Munich, Frankfurt, or Amsterdam, and from there it's like an hour and fifteen or hour and a half. So, so like a, but we're talking what a sixteen-hour flight, door to door from San Francisco to Budapest is about yeah fourteen, fifteen hours. Oh, good God! So. I hope they're flying you at least business class. <laughs> funny. I'm, I, I'm like I don't get jet lagged anymore. It's weird. I just I, like I'm so used to it. I just show up. I'm awake or asleep, and and uh, I really it doesn't affect me anymore. I don't know. Wow. Maybe I'm just in the zombie mode. <laughs> the other one is actually for me is like doing these two hour or three hour like New York Central or, or uh, Eastern time zones, because like you have a you know you get in at um, like nine p.m. or whatever, and you're trying to go to sleep at like midnight. It's only nine o'clock, and you have a eight a.m. meeting, which feels like five a.m. in the morning. I mean, that that's worse. <laughs> For me, that's that's the bad one. I keep on joking that I need to get a a, a GoFundMe project started so that I can get uh, flown out to Budapest and tour the studio. Um, <laughs> but then I started pricing it. I was like, "Ooh, that's going to be a chunk of change in order to get people to pay for that." <laughs> the uh, uh, the Williams Pinball mobile app. Uh, as everybody knows here, I've been doing a whole documentation thing and I'm not going to weigh you down with any of that. I actually sent you an email and I think you were just like, uh, yeah, let me pass that along. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of went nuts. What can I say? But one of the things that I've been hearing a lot, and I thought I just would throw this out there as a, as a suggestion to pass along. Um, one of the things I hear a lot from people is they're not being able to play the pro mode. And, and experience just how different that is. You know, some of these people are mobile only players um, or their platform is an iPad. So they're not able to uh, experience what it was like on the FX3 platform itself. And to me, I thought about, well, guy in the challenge modes, there's always a, you know, it's a, a five star, 10 star, 15 star kind of grade and 15 star earnings is always more difficult. And I was like, wouldn't that be a perfect spot to, have that be in pro mode so people can at least sample it and therefore know whether or not they want to just outright purchase these things instead of grind for uh to getting to that level but it is one of the main things that i've heard from people where they're like i don't even know what the new physics feel like because i'm stuck you know playing the the uh uh grinding yeah. basic levels 
So I just thought that, that would be it'd be an interesting way of letting people sample it without having it whole hog. I yeah, I agree with you. Um, you know, so I haven't uh, I haven't been super close to Williams Mobile for the last uh, little period here. I've been very occupied with a lot of other things, <clears throat> but. We have a lot of updates planned for the for Williams Mobile itself. The game has represented new uh, new ground for us in free to play and mobile and pinball. And it's not you know it's not perfect by any means. Um, it's doing a lot of things better than what we did previously, but there are some issues. Um, you know, and it makes just us talking about it right now. You know, you make a it's a very simple thing like people who want to play the new physics, and and they can't. Like yeah, that that should be fixed. Uh, <laughs> I, I agree and uh you know i'll go and we'll, we'll talk with the team and, and see what we can do about that but um you know sometimes you're so close to something like we're, yeah. we're you're so close to it you don't see the obvious things in front of you and, and that's sometimes in life and uh in business or a game that you're so close to so i, I appreciate you bringing that up um i think we should figure that out the other good news is i checked out what your uh uh App Store rating is, and it's significantly gone up uh, from the the dismal score that it had been having. So clearly, people are finally playing it. Uh, they've gotten past the, the 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 currency aspect of things, and are actually now playing the game itself and going, "Hey, this is pretty dang good." Um, so, I mean, I know that I spend way too much time with it when I'm sitting in the car waiting to pick up my boy. So. <laughs> Funny, I think the approach that we've taken, you know, it's been a good, it, there's, there's good things about it and there's maybe not so good things. And is that in mobile, it's a very, it's a very challenging space. And we took the approach, let's try to be all things to all people. You know, I mean, we knew that that would be complicated, but if people, the majority of mobile people don't spend a dime, they'll play and they'll, get, they'll, they'll spend, they'll let an ad go by and then they'll keep playing. So sure. Let's let them do that. Pinball players, a large, a, a what feels like a large crowd to you is actually a very small percentage of the people, but they just want to buy it and own it and they don't care about grinding. Just give it to me and I'll tell me what it costs and they'll do it. So we try to do that as well. And then there's the virtual currency. People just want to buy some coins and they think like, oh, this is fun. It's like my little arcade. So that would be flexible and try to give everybody what they want with it. Um, we fall into this space again with pinball because it's so, it's so the game itself is so well known. People say, Oh, a pinball game. I'm going to play that then you don't know how they want to monetize and we need to make, we need to get something um, for it. So it's a challenge. we took that approach like to try to be all things. And, uh, and so there's, there's some problems with that, which one, the one about not, uh, not being able to access all features, just if you come in and play it is one of those things. But I do think that the, the physics, um, you know, they deserve to be, they deserve to be played uh, in the way that we built them for, for Williams. So. Well, I think one of the reasons why I mentioned that is a lot of people had already had all the tables in Farsight's version, and the Zen physics and Farsight physics, yes, there's a difference, but it's not pronounced like it is when you play the pro physics, which is just like night and day. There's no comparison to anything on mobile that plays remotely like that. And so that's where it's just like, oh, it's such a shame because I think a lot of those people, if they just played that, would go like, oh, okay, now I'm now I'll commit to this, you know, uh, right. rather than giving it five minutes and going, <laughs> <laughs> which I, that's another problem with the mobile market in general. So I mean, I've done it myself. I download a game, I play for five minutes, go, and eh, I don't need this taking up space on my phone, and <laughs> gone, you know. So it is, it's a, it's definitely a fine line you have to uh, traverse. Yeah, and you think about changing like demographics and socioeconomics and all these different things. I mean, like there's a whole group of uh, however we identify them, call them people 20 years uh, and younger, and then even like 15 and younger. Their primary gaming device now is a phone or an iPad. They yeah. don't even they never played a game on a console. They never played a game on a PC. They just equate their mobile device with their gaming platform. Yeah, you know, it's changing. Well. That is, uh, guy. We covered tons of topics, so I thank you for uh, spending the time with us to uh, to do all this. Um, I'm very excited to hear that. Yes, alphanumerics will be on the cards at some point. That it's not just only DMDs and nothing else. So that's uh, that'll make a lot of people happy. And uh, Volume Four comes out. Uh, was it May 28th? I believe. Yep, 12 days from now. Yeah. There you go. So uh, 
get those uh, get those uh, wallets ready to uh, purchase, folks, because here it comes. And uh, again, thank you so much for talking with us. And next release, we'll talk again. Cool. Yep. Always uh, happy to talk with you. Thanks. And thank you, everybody, for uh, listening. And uh, make sure you check out our website, blockadepinball.com slash episodes for all past episodes. And uh, be sure to follow all of us. And I always keep on saying it. Follow Zen and Pinball FX th uh, 3 on Twitter. So much stuff drops that you don't even know. So do that and uh, stay ahead of the game. All right. We will talk to you again. Bye-bye.